Good evening to everybody. My name is Domenico Minotti, and I want to welcome you to the first English program of our new season for Dante. We are doing this in the era of uh, COVID via Zoom Room, and I think we've worked out most of the bugs, but if not, please bear with us and be patient. We've kept the topic a secret, uh, advertising only that it would be about a staple of the Italian diet. And if you look closely at the map of Italy on our first slide, you can probably figure out that it's going to be about pasta. One of the really nice features about Zoom is that people can join the Zoom room from anywhere in the world. So I've invited some family members and friends from all over the US and from Italy to join in as my clack. Then I thought, well, maybe I can extend this invitation even farther than this world and reach into the spirit world. So why not invite the, the shade of our eponymous patron, Dante himself, to participate? Dante did say he would be delighted, but he was concerned about COVID. I reassured him that if he were to maintain social distancing, easy to do given his location in Paradiso with the love of his life and his guide to paradise, Beatrice, shouldn't be a problem. And especially if he wore protective equipment and he agreed to do that. Well, Beatrice regrets that she won't be able to come. She had a Tupperware party to go to. So welcome to Dante and welcome to all of you to this first English presentation of our Aunt Dante season for this year. So here's a map of Italy. And as you can see, if you look really closely, um, it's made from different kinds of pasta. And in fact, that's what our conversation tonight will be about. So here's Dante with his mask on. And here's uh, the first slide of our pasta presentation. All you wanted to know maybe about pasta, maybe more than you might want to know, Nearly every country in the world has a unique version of this staple. Uh, Germany and Hungary have Spetsli, Poland, Pierogi, Ashkenazi Jews have Kreplach, Greece is Orzo, and of course there's wontons. What does pasta come from? Well, it comes from wheat, but a special kind of wheat, which is called durum wheat, or pasta wheat, or macaroni wheat. Um, it's uh, developed from emmer wheat, which has been grown in the Near East since around 7,000 BC, it's the second most cultivated species of wheat after common wheat, although it only represents about 8% of the global wheat production. Like emmer wheat, uh, durum wheat is on, which means it has bristles as opposed to common wheat. And it's still the predominant wheat that's grown in the Middle East. So pasta in Italian means pasta or paste, and it's a dough uh, made of uh, water and eggs. It's made from a grain flour, wheat, and it can be made into other grains as well. It's mixed into a paste or dough with water and eggs. Uh, eggs in the north uh, and the south, mostly semolina and water. Um, in modern Italy, commercial pasta is durum wheat alone. It's the only type of wheat that is allowed for in commercial preparations. It can be formed or cut into sheets, other shapes, and cooked by boiling, frying, or baking. Durham wheat um, are, and water and eggs are all simple components that have been around for centuries. And the use of durum wheat sets, this, sets pasta apart from other forms of noodles. Durham wheat has a high gluten content, a low moisture content, making it perfectly suited to pasta production. When durum wheat um, pasta is dried, it lasts indefinitely, making it a very convenient food to store. Because of its uh, affordability, pasta has uh, 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 a long shelf life and versatility, and it became firmly rooted in Italian culture. Much of the wheat used in Italy comes actually from the US and Canada, from the Great Plains of Iowa and Alberta, but a lot of it is also grown in the Middle East. Historically, the first certain record of noodles cooked by boiling is in the Jerusalem Talmud, References written in Aramaic in the fifth century AD. In the first century AD, um, 
The Talmud also includes a discussion on whether or not boiled dough should be considered unleavened bread under Jewish law. Uh, let's see. Dried noodles are portable, while fresh noodles must be eaten immediately. More than likely, um, pasta was introduced during the Arab conquest of Sicily from 827 to 1061. The Arab geographer Ali Drizi, who lived in these years, um, So what is pasta? Pasta is a starchy noodle or dumpling that's made from grain flour, mostly wheat, although there are other grains that can be used. It's mixed into a paste or dough with water and eggs. Traditionally in Southern Italy, semolina and water are used, but in the Northern regions where semolina was not available, regular flour and eggs were also used. In modern Italy, however, commercial pasta is always durum wheat and it's the only type of wheat that's allowed for uh, making modern pasta. <clears throat> Once it's uh, formed, it can be cut into sheets and other shapes and cooked by boiling, frying, or baking. Unleavened dough, which is ground durum wheat and, and water and eggs, are all simple components that have been around for centuries. The use of durum wheat sets pasta apart from other forms of noodles. Durham wheat has a high gluten content and low moisture, making it perfectly suited to pasta production. When durham wheat pasta is dried, it lasts indefinitely, making it a very convenient food to store. Over time, because of pasta's affordability, shelf life, and versatility, it became firmly rooted in the Italian culture. Much of the wheat, durham wheat, that's grown, it comes from the US and Canada, exported to Italy, where it's made into pasta there, and then we export it out to the rest of the world. The first certain record of noodles cooked by boiling is in the Jerusalem um, Talmud, references written in Aramaic in the fifth century AD. The Talmud includes a discussion on whether or not boiled dough should be considered unleavened bread under Jewish law. In the first century AD, Horace wrote about Lagana, fine, she fine sheets of fried dough, which were an everyday food stuff. In the second century, Athenaeus provides a recipe for Lagana, sheets of wheat flour and the juice of crushed lettuce flavored with spices and deep fried. And an early fifth, cent fifth century cookbook describes a dish called Lagana that consists of layers of dough with meat stuffing probably an ancestor of our modern day lasagna. The method of cooking these sheets of dough does not really correspond to our modern definition of either a fresh or dry pasta product. These ingredients are similar, perhaps the shape, um, but perhaps a different, different form completely. The first concrete information concerning pasta products in Italy dates from the 13th or 14th century. Now, let's talk about Marco Polo. <clears throat> the legend of Marco Polo and importing pasta from China has been completely debunked. It originated with the Macaroni Journal in the 1920s or 30s as an advertisement for a spaghetti company with the goal of promoting pasta in the United States, which it did. The Chinese are known to have been eating a noodle-like food as early as 3000 BC, but Marco Polo describes the starchy product made from breadfruit, hardly a durum wheat. The first mention of a pasta recipe in, is in the book, De Arte Cochinaria per Vermicelli e Macaroni Siciliani, The Art of Cooking Sicilian Macaroni and Vermicelli, by Martino de Rossi, an Italian 15th century culinary expert called the Prince of Cooks, the Western world's first celebrity chef, long before Lydia and Nick Stallone and Amaril and Martha. He made his career in Italy as a chef at the Roman Palazzo of the Papal Cham Chamberlain. And his book, The Art of Cooking in 1465, is considered a landmark in Italian gastronomic literature and a historical record of the transition from medieval to Renaissance cuisine. 
Some historians think that the Sicilian word macaroni translates as made into a dough by force is the origin of our word macaroni. Anyone who has kneaded durum wheat knows that force is necessary. It's difficult to knead. In the ancient methods of making pasta, force meant kneading the dough with the feet, often a process that took a full day. Ancient Sicilian lasagna dishes, some that are still eaten in Sicily today, included raisins and spices brought by the Arab invaders, another indication that the Arabs introduced pasta. Whether the Arabs used sauce on their pasta is questionable. The array of sauces may be an Italian invention. What is certain is that the climate of Italy was perfect for growing durum wheat, a hard wheat from which we get the semolina, and the availability of the wheat ensured its popularity in Italy. Soft wheat can be used for fresh pasta, but semolina is used for dried pasta. The dish probably took hold in Italy as a result of extensive Mediterranean trading in the Middle Ages. From the 13th century on, references to pasta dishes, macaroni, ravioli, and gnocchi, vermicelli, crop up with increasing frequency across the Italian peninsula. In the 14th century, Boccaccio wrote the Decameron, and in it is a tale of a mouth-watering fantasy, which consisted of a mountain of Parmesan cheese down which pasta chefs roll macaroni and ravioli to gluttons that are eagerly waiting below. In the 14th and 15th centuries, dried pasta became popular for its easy storage. This allowed people to store pasta on ships when exploring the new world. A century later, pasta was present around the globe during the voyages of discovery. Spanish settlers were among the first to bring pasta to America. Thomas Jefferson helped to give pasta a push into popularity as well. During his stay in Paris from 1784 to 1789, he ate what was called macaroni back then. The word could have referred to any shape of pasta. He enjoyed the dish so much that he returned to America with two cases in tow. When his supply ran out, he sent for reinforcements via a friend of his who lived in Naples. Dried pasta became popular throughout the 14th and 15th centuries as it could be easily stored on ships, among them uh, ships that were setting out to explore the New World. Various types of pasta, including long hollow tubes, are mentioned in the 15th century records of monasteries, Italian and Dominican monasteries. By the 17th century, pasta had become part of the daily diet throughout Italy because it was economical, readily available, and quite versatile. Tomatoes were introduced to Italy in the 16th century from the New World by the Spanish and incorporated into Italian cuisine in the 17th century. The first Italian tomato sauces date from the late 18th century the first written record of pasta with tomato sauce can be found in a 1790 cookbook, La Piccio Moderno, by a Roman chef, Francesco Leonardi. Before tomato sauce was introduced, pasta was eaten dry with the fingers. The liquid sauce in later versions demanded the use of a fork. The warm Mediterranean climate of Italy is suited to growing fresh vegetables and herbs, which meant that Italians would get creative with a delicious variety of pasta sauces tomato-based sauces emerge as a favorite complement to pasta, and tomatoes now remain the most popular ingredient in pasta sauces today. Now here's a picture of a fabrica de macaroni in Naples, and Naples was particularly uh, good for making pasta because it was a combination of, of hot, dry air, but also uh, onshore breezes from the ocean, which had humidity in it, so it maintained just the proper uh, blend of dryness and humidification that allowed the pasta to dry slowly so that it was, that it was dried without cracking or having any, any cracks in it. And as I said before, the pasta in those days was eaten primarily with the fingers. And here you can see some guys in Naples eating pasta with their fingers. And here's some more eating pasta with their fingers including these two young tykes here. Only later, when sauces were, in, were um, included, did the uh, eating of pasta require forks, as these pictures suggest. But here you can see that even though you can see the forks in the, in the photograph, 
it looks like they're really almost eating it with their fingers or at least inhaling it completely. And for those folks who have not yet reached the age of eating with forks, uh, the fingers still suffice to get the pasta in or over, <laughs> as the case may be. So nutrition facts. Um, there are three main uh, kinds of dishes, pasta asciutta, pasta in brodo, pasta al forno, but the nutrition is basically um, mostly carbohydrates, which is starch, 6% protein, low in fat, has some manganese in it and some micronutrients. Pasta asciutta, of course, is cooked and served with a side sauce or condiment. Pasta in brodo are smaller shapes used in soups, and pasta al forno is baked in an oven. And then, of course, there's pasta seca, which is dried pasta, and pasta fresca, which is fresh pasta. Pasta seca is most commercially made via extrusion, forcing the dough through plates with various uh, shapes cut into them to make the pasta shapes that, uh, that are then dried. Pasta fresca is traditionally made by hand or with a machine. Both of them come in many shapes and varieties, long and short shapes, tubes, flat shapes, sheets, miniature shapes for, for soups, and other shapes that are meant to be stuffed. And of course, there are specialty or decorative shapes. And there's also pasta made from other grains like lentils, uh, garbanzos, uh, for gluten-free diets, etc. Now moving on to the different forms and shapes of pasta, there are 310 specific forms and 1,300 documented names which vary by locale. We're gonna talk about a few of these uh, in the rest of the presentation. And this is the part of the presentation that will be actually on the quiz. So you might wanna to try to remember the names and think about the pictures that are associated with them. So the first set of, of pastas are tubular pastas, like spaghetti, a long, thin, solid, cylindrical noodle pasta. Spaghettini is thinner. Ini at the end of a word means smaller or, or, or thinner. Ini here, et cetera. Um, ili or ette are also words that mean smaller or thinner. And then one, as we'll see later on, means a form that is thicker or heavier, et cetera. So capellini, which means the word itself means little hairs. And then of course is capelli d'angelo, which are angel, angel hair, the hair of angels, or our famous angel hair pasta. Our next slide will show um, spaghetti alla guitarra, which is a, a favorite from Abruzzo, uh, also made in Lazio, however, where it's called tonarelli. And this is a string shaped instrument, uh, wires on it. Um, the pasta sheet is, is, is put on top. A roller is made uh, to force the pasta through the strings and it comes out as strands, which in cross section are more square shaped. In Tadni, a similar um, form is called Ciriole. In Genoa, Bavette are similar pastas that are, that are long strands, but are oval in cross section. And then of course we have the fettuccine, which is Ine, of course, and the linguine, which are also forms of pasta that are long, um, long noodle shapes. The next form of pasta we're gonna talk about are the spiral shaped pastas, like rotini and fusilli, often uh, used interchangeably. Rotini, however, are extruded through a machine. Fusilli are extruded and then twisted afterward. Another form, elica, are uh, similar, but are more tightly wound so that they don't unfold as much when you cook them. And then there are gemelli, which stands for twins, which is double twisted like a helix. Moving on to one of the favorite ones, farfalle, which stands for butterflies in Italian. It's a type of pasta known as bow tie pasta or butterfly pasta. A larger version of farfalle is called farfelloni, while the miniature version is called farfellini. Now here's some farfelloni, pot holders, which are not made from pasta, but made from silicon, but actually have the shape of the farfalone, the large uh, farfalle. In Modena, the same form is known as trichetti, um, and it's very typical of the Emilia-Romagna uh, region. The next forms of pasta we're going to talk about are, are the gomiti. Gomito means elbow, 
So this is your typical elbow pasta. Kifari is another form of that. Kifari regati, and here we need to think about another uh, word derivation. Riga means fold or pleat. So these are pastas that on the outside have pleats or folds uh, in, uh, formed into the pasta, whereas lisho, which means smooth, are pasta forms that are without these forms. Uh, kifari regati, gomati, uh, elbow macaroni, and then uh, just the other day, I found another one called sedani. Sedano in Italian means celery. And if you look at this pasta, it looks like the outside of a celery stalk. These used to be called zanne d'elefante, which stands for the tusks of elephants, but that's become um, in, you know, politically incorrect with the ban against ivory. So it's been renamed sedani instead. One of my favorites are the uh, pastas that are named after seafood. So lumake, which stands for snail, these are real lumake. And there's the, there's the lumake pasta here. And here's a snail uh, from, 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 uh, from, from Brazil, which is really a lumacone. And we have the similar version in pasta called the lumacone. And then in addition to the lumake, we have conchilia. This is the real conchilia, which is seashell. And this is the pasta conchilla, which are the, the pasta seashells. And here's a dish made from that. These are thought to originally come from Piedmont, which is next to France, bordering France. The love of snails is a Francophone influ influence. Maybe people were starving in that area or weren't too picky back in the day, but that's where the lumake uh, really come from. The next form that we're gonna talk about are penne. Penne, which means feather or quill or pen. This is a real quill or feather, and you can see how it's made into a, a stylus for calligraphy. And the reason that penne are so named is because they are cut on a diagonal at their ends, similar to the way that quills were cut. They're cylinder-shaped pieces. Um, they resemble the, the nibs of a steel a fountain pen, a steel pen, or a quill pen. Um, it's one of the few shapes of pasta that we know the date of its birth. In 1865, Giovanni Battista Caputo, who was a pasta maker from, from Genova, obtained a patent for a diagonal cutting machine, which allowed his, him, him to produce the fresh pasta into a pen shape without crushing it. The size is varying between one inch for mezze penne, or half pens, and two inches for full pens, penne. Mostaccioli, known in Italy as penne lisce, are penne without the, the ridges or the pleats. Mostaccioli also means mustache in Italian. This is a specialty of the Campania region, Naples, Capri, Sorrento. And on, unlike the penne, which are rich, these are lisce in texture. Ziti has an interesting derivation. Ziti is from the Naples region, and a southern dialect, the word ziti means engaged to be married. And this pasta was once upon a time served exclusively during the celebration of marriages. Now it's often used in baked macaroni dishes such as ziti al forno, which is an Italian American specialty now. Ziti is an extruded pasta similar to penne with the ends cut straight across rather than at a, as a, at a diagonal. And then we have rigatoni, again, only meaning big, big tubes, which can be in any size and length, larger than penne and ziti, sometimes uh, curved, slightly curved, but not as curved as the elbow macaroni. And sedani we already talked about, um, meeting the elephant tusks um, originally and then changed uh, after ivy was banned. Now we have some special shapes, rotella, little wheels, rote in Italian, and here's some, uh, some examples of that. Fiore, which are our uh, our flowers, rotella we know in um, the U.S. as as wagon wheels, and the fiore, and then we have radiatori and armonica, which called to call to mind uh, engineering terms or a musical instrument, radiators or harmonicas. The next shape I want to talk about are garganelli, which is from the Emilia Romagna region as well, which is an egg-based pasta formed by taking a a square of pasta and rolling it on a special instrument to form a tubular shape. These are ridged rigati, 
And here's another machine, Petina, which means comb. And um, these are Gaganelli Lishi without the ridges. And whenever I didn't know it, uh, the derivation of a word, I would look it up. So I looked at Gaganelli in my Italian dictionary and couldn't find that word. I could find Gaganella, however. And a Gaganella refers to drinking from a flask or a bottle without the bottle or flask touching your lips. This is a practice that I tend to associate with Spain with leather um, flasks uh, holding wine, but I guess it's also known in Italy. The next pasta I'm gonna talk about is orecchietti. Orecchio means ear. Orecchietti are little ears. This is uh, from Apulia. And uh, these tend to be a little bit chewier than, uh, than other pastas, and they're often served with broccoli sauces. And then we have mafalda, a ribbon-shaped pasta, about a centimeter in width, with wavy edges on both sides, usually served with a delicate sauce. Mafaldini are little, uh, little, little mafalda, and one form of that is called reginette, which is uh, little queens named after the princess Mafalda di Savoia, who reigned from 1902 to 1944. One of the more common ones that we will see are canelloni. Canella means reed, and canelloni means large reeds, long cylindrical uh, types of pasta. Uh, canelloni usually served with the filling and covered by the sauce in Italian cuisine. Popular stuffings including spinach, ricotta, minced beef, often stuffed with meat or vegetables, but often topped with the bechamel or tomato sauce. Manicotti, the word means cooked hands, and it makes you think about muffs where your hands would be kept warm in the wintertime. Manicotti is the Italian American version of cannelloni, which gets treated more or less like cannelloni. In other words, the, the pasta is blanched, stuffed, layered, and baked just with American ingredients. Manicotti mo usually has this cheese filling and a red sauce. So they're, they're similar, they're both tubes. Manicotti tubes are ridged, larger, and slightly thicker. Cannelloni tubes are smooth, a touch smaller, and slightly thinner. Moving on, there are a variety of pasta shapes that are used in broths or soups, and uh, they are smaller, of course, and their names uh, refer to their shape, Herstellini from stars, semi di melone, melon seeds, orzo, which are barley seeds, or risoni, which are rice granules, arcini di pepper, peppercorns, quadretti, which are uh, square-shaped pieces, anellini, little rings, alphabetini, alphabet shapes, letters of the alphabet, fregola, which is a Sardinian form uh, that's, uh, that stands for fish, fish roll, and these look like caviar or fish roll, and then ditalini, which are thimbles. And these are shapes that are used uh, to add to soups or broths, etc. Moving on to ravioli, which are thin pastel uh, dough shapes with the filling, usually served in broth or with a sauce. They're commonly square, but they can be circular or semicircular. Along with tortellini, the most common use of the stuffed pasta shapes, tiny, tiny round raviolis are often called medaglioni, little metals. So here's how they're made. They're made by hand here, partially by hand here, then cut with the cutting tool. They're made in forms that give you a semi-lunar shape with special rolling pins that, that produce a square shape. The medaglioni are made in this kind of form, and you can also make them in a machine where you put the filling and the dough all together, spin the crank, and out comes the ravioli already, already filled and ready to cut apart. This looks like an Atlas machine, or at least like the Atlas machine I used to have. And in the next slide, we see some familiar shapes of so the round pastas, square, uh, square raviolis here, obviously made by hand uh, with the tines of a fork to, to pinch them together. Semilunar shapes, again here, and here's a, an, uh, an example of a ravioli dish. There are some spe specialty shapes that are kind of interesting. Caramelle, which stands for uh, candy in Italian, are, are pasta shapes that are twisted at the end uh, like, uh, like candies and with the filling. 
And sometimes the filling is, is visible if they leave it uh, partly open. It's an egg, an egg, an egg, egg based uh, soft pasta. That's often stuff that you call it the base filling. And the next one is sacchetti, little purses or money bags with scrunch tops with meat or cheese fillings. And then sacchettoni, which are uh, beggar's purses, are larger forms of that, uh, again, filled with uh, various fillings and then fastened at the top. Let's move on to lasagna that we mentioned briefly before, but we're going to spend a little bit more time on now. The Greek word uh, laganon uh, is, is thought to be the origin of the word lasagna. And laganon refers to a flat sheet of pasta dough cut into strips, still used in Greece to mean a flat thin type of unleavened bread baked for the holiday Clean Monday. Now Clean Monday is the Monday before Ash Wednesday. So it's similar to our Mardi Gras in that it is the last day on which you can really stuff yourself and eat whatever you want. And so Clean Monday was a day in which these particular pasta noodles were, um, were, were baked and served with seafood and a sauce. Um, another theory is that the word lasagna comes from the Greek word lasagna, which means a trivet or a pot or a chamber pot. The Romans took this term over and used it to mean not only the cooking pot, but also the trivet and, and the, uh, the cooking pot, the trivet, and the pasta itself, and later the food take, took on the name of this serving dish. It's interesting that regional usage in Italy, when referring to the baked dish, favors the plural lasagna in the north of the country and also in Great Britain, whereas the singular form, lasagna, is favored in the south and in American English. And here we see Lagana, the original uh, Greek bread still used in the Greek uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, very similar to matzah, two forms of that. And here's the lasagna sheets. And here you see lasagna strips that are uh, uh, crenellated on the side, ruffled, etc. So there are many different varieties and forms of that. We'll see a few of those. So lasagna was known in Italy in the Middle Ages in the city of Naples. The first recorded recipe was in the 14th century cookbook, uh, Liber de Coquina. Lasagna refers to the white flat pasta and also the dish that's made from it. In Bologna, as we know, uh, there's a favorite dish, uh, lasagna alla, Bolo alla Bolognese, lasagna Bolognese, which are traditionally green pasta, which is made by using spinach or other vegetables in the dough and served with a thick ragu of onions, carrots, celery, ground pork, beef, butter, tomatoes, etc., and served with bechamel and parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Variations of lasagna type pasta depend on the size and shape and whether the edges are ruffled. Lasagnetta is a type of ribbon pasta, a narrower, narrower version of lasagna. And festonella are small squares that are cut from the lasagnetta. Pantace are small pieces of lasagnetta that are also cut with slightly, uh, 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 slight differences between the two. Here's a typical uh, lasagna dish. Here's lasagna, here's the bolognese lasagna, the green pasta. Here's the pantace cut on the diagonal from the lasagnetta strips. And there's the festonelle, which are cut square cut rather than on the diagonal. Moving on to capelletti, which means little hats, are plump meat-filled pasta served in a rich capon or chicken broth. Some say the best come from Gubbio, where it's a tradition um, to have, have uh, capelletti on, on Christmas. But this is also a tradition in many other parts of Italy. Tortellini are very similar to capelletti. The only difference is that uh, capelletti are made from squares of pasta, tortellini are made from circles of pasta, and they have different stuffings. Tortellini are ring-shaped from the region of Emilia uh, Romagna, Bologna being the main city there. They also are described as being navel-shaped um, with an alternative name of belly buttons. They bear a strong resemblance to a large wonton. Generally filled with meat or cheese, they're made from circles rather than squares, so they don't have the peaks of the capelletti. Then we have uh, ingana preti, which are also called finti capelletti or false capelletti. 
These are, this is another pasta that comes from Emilia Romagna, was a joke, at, a joke at the expense of the clergy. Priests would often drop in on their parishioners uninvited at supper time, and of course the parishioners, at least the wife, would feel obliged to feed them. So they would be served the capoletti that were made from leftover pasta after the filling had run out. The shape is similar to tortellinis, but without the filling. So here's tortellini. Here's a capoletti of the squares. You can see the, the corners sticking up like a Yankee doodle hat. And here's the ingana preti, which are the tortellini made from the round, but without the filling. And then we come to my favorite, are the strozza preti and the strangero privete, which stands for priest chokers or priest stranglers. There are many variations of this pasta and many tales explaining its origin. Originally, it probably comes from the Greek word uh, stragalo, to roll up into a ball, and prepto, to hollow up. So that describes the method of shaping this pasta, rolling the dough into thin cylinders, cutting them into small sections that are hollowed up and rolled with the thumb. A similar technique is used to make cavatelli pasta, from the Latin word cavare, meaning to hollow up, our word cave comes from that, which is another uh, long hand-rolled macaroni um, uh, that's, uh, that's made from soft pasta as well. So the strozza preti refer to two different versions of pasta. Um, it started in Southern Italy uh, with the Sonangro Priviete, the free, the free stranglers or free chokers. So in 1524, Antonio Camuria, who was a cook that worked for the noble Neapolitan family of the Carafa, made uh, this Strangolo Priviete, which is a snort of gnocchi. He made it by mixing together cacio cavallo cheese, ricotta eggs, almonds, shaping it into small balls of strogolos in Greek, cooked in chicken broth, and finally served with more cacio cavallo cheese and dusted with sugar and cinnamon. Yum. The recipe of Camoria refers not to the macaroni pasta, but likely to this gnocchi type pasta. The literal translation of strozza preti is priest chokers or priest stranglers. The priests who were notorious for their gluttony were so fond of this pasta and they ate it with such speed and such greed that they would choke on it. And the husbands of the cooks who had marked anti-clerical jealous feelings wished the priests to choke on their supper and would stand by smirking while the priest choked away. Strozza preti are the elongated form of cavatelli, but the other kinds of uh, strozza preti are more of the uh, gnocchi shape kind of thing, especially in Corsica, which are huge gnocchi shaped uh, uh, pasta that were large enough to choke a hung hungry priest. And we'll see examples of that in the next slide. These are the strozza preti. This is how they're made, wringing the necks of the priest by wringing the necks of the pasta. This is a dish of strozza preti. And these are the Corsican strozza preti, large enough to choke a priest. So at this point, uh, we paused for a moment to take questions and comments before we went on, but uh, we're going to move directly on to the next section without a break here. So for the next part of the presentation, I'm gonna take you to my hometown, Sant'Angelo, Limosano, and Molise, Italy. Here's Casino, here's Benevento, here's Foggia, is Tadmoli, and this is Sant'Angelo di Mozano. Molise was a part of Obruzzo, Obruzzo Molise until separated in 1963. The province of Campobasso was split from the region to form Molise, with the remaining four provinces of Aquila, Teramo, Pescara, and Chieti, which still comprise present-day Abruzzo. Molise, unfortunately, has always been on the outskirts. In ancient times, the region was home to the Samnites, a mysterious tribe that fought numerous battles with the Romans, winning three times before being subjugated in the third century BC. Poor and mountainous like many other parts of Italy, Molise was largely ignored by the Romans and then by the Lombards, by the Normans, by the, Bur by the Bourbons, and pretty much everybody else who passed through. Molise became part of Obruzzi and Molise after World War II, but split off in 1963 to now become Italy's youngest and second smallest after the Val d'Aosta and least known region. 
The reasons for the separation from Abruzzo are fairly arcane. Many residents will argue that perhaps it was a mistake that we should reunite with Abruzzo, but others, uh, others feel that we are very proud of our region. And unlike most other parts of Italy, here you can still find life as it used to be, unchanged for centuries. To stimulate uh, growth and prosperity in Molise, a group of five tourism entrepreneurs uh, wanted to share the love, the beauty, and authenticity of the region by offering a true experience to visitors where culture, environment, tourist attractions, and typical products and craftsmanship, expressing the essence of the people of Molise and Italian life, still persist to this day. So they have developed hotels, food tours, farm stays, cultural visits, and state that we are trying to attract people who have already been, been to Rome and Venice and Florence and are looking for something completely off the tourist trap. In a way, we are Italy's last great unknown. It's a region that has historically struggled with poverty, isolation, earthquakes, and depopulation. In the mid 19th century, my little hometown boosted over 1,600 inhabitants. Nowadays, less than 300, as I came to find out when I visited there last summer. Molise is de so depopulated that the president of the region of Molise is offering to pay people to move to Molise if they would stay for a year, build a house, and contribute to the infrastructure and to the economy of the region. Private investment, however, remains very low. Infrastructure is poor. Unemployment is high. Many young people leave to search for work. For some, the expression Molise doesn't exist is less a joke and more of a prediction about the region's future. Nonetheless, let's go to Sant'Angelo Limosano. This is a typical hilltop town of Southern Italy. Here you can see La Rampa. And there's an old story in my family that one of my ancestors got into a fight with one of the Paisani and threw him off the ramp and I think killed him, but I don't know the truth. And of course, nobody will tell me the true story anymore. But in that town, here's the church. And along the street here, right alongside the church, is the home of my Zio Natale. And I have an arrow here showing the location of the Pet Baco Hotel, which is going to come into play in the next couple of slides. So this area of Molise is famous for white truffles. So in the cellars of this Pad Baco Hotel, which is here, right next door in this building lives my cousin still, my cousin Virgilio. In this Pad Baco Hotel, you can see some paisani enjoying themselves. This is a typical cantina or one of the rooms that's formed there. It used to be a castle and they had a festival and at the festival they served Strasa Preti al Tartufo. So here you can see a sign showing uh, outside the festival, the Cantina Castello, so named because a castle was once on that site, and the dish was Strosa Preti al Tartufo. Another sign reads, Il bello del vino è che per due ore i tuoi problemi sono di altri. The beauty of wine is that for two hours at least, your problems become the problems of other people. And for this festival, they did in fact serve Strozza Preti al Tartufo. Here's a Strozza Preti. Here are the shavings from the white truffles served with it. You can just imagine the twist and necks of Fries as you look at this dish. The next slide shows um, a copy of the quiz, which is going to be hard to see on, on, this, uh, on this slide, but you will, you will be able to um, upload it or download it rather from this link here, which will show you not only the quiz, but the answer key, which will be the next slide, and um, also a recorded version of this presentation, as well as uh, two other versions that are text without narration, one in English and one that I translated with the help of Google Translation into Italian. So, these are the answers to the clues. You'll be able to download that from the, uh, from the site. So, basta basta. I think 
probably enough. I covered just a few of the 310 different, different uh, forms of pasta and the 16, over 1,600 different names. So with that, I say allora grazie per la vostra collaborazione e attenzione e auguri a tutti. Thank you very much. Thank you.